Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Tucker Edmonds, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture. Welcome to the fourth session of the Center's Religion and series. Religion and is a series of monthly conversations between leading academics and thinkers in multiple fields hosted by the Center to continue critically important conversations around the fields of American studies and religious studies. The first three episodes were, were dynamic and thought-provoking discussions on issues and questions that impact our fields and our divided society. I want to thank the scholars who took time out of their schedules to provide nuanced and engaged discussions to challenge the fields of religion and American studies and to continue a discussion amongst scholars and thinkers and community members who have questions around these issues. I wanna thank Pippa and Ryan and Krista and Richard for last month's discussion on vaccines and pandemics, which was right on time and an engaging and thoughtful discussion that we're still talking about. The responses to these episodes have been fantastic. And please note that we are sharing the full episodes on our website and our YouTube channel, as well as what we're calling hot takes, quick moments from these conversations that you can use in your classrooms and as conversation starters, as you want to use and think about these topics with students and with other members in the community. And you can find those on our Twitter feed, on our YouTube channel, and as well on our website. Um, I wanna thank you again for joining us today. And we hope that you will join us every third Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time as we discuss topics that look at the relationship between re religion, the pressing issues of our day and their impacts on our field of study. Today, our fourth session examines religion and memorializing the state. The United States is an idea, one that for better or for worse has been contested and affirmed through generations of voting and the practice of voting. And while democracy is far more than a presidential election, that contest captures both the popular imagination of what the nation is, while also quietly or directly designating who will run the country. Therefore, the president inherits a popular faith as well as an office. They assume a role that is often seen as much sacred as it is political, and they perform duties not unfamiliar to leaders of religious communities throughout the country. Thus, the presidential inauguration that I'm sure many of you all watched and engaged in yesterday, uh, every four years serves as perhaps the key ceremony in memorializing the state. And so today we're gonna to think about and talk around and through and, and, and engage a lot of issues around memorializing the state and the role that it plays in developing and helping us understand our country and our relationship to it. So as we do that, I wanna give you a, a, a few quick reminders. Please remember that throughout today's session, we were asking folks to submit questions through the question and answer feature on Zoom. You are free to use the chat feature, but we are asking that you use the Q&A feature to ask questions and our host and panelists will be reviewing those as we go through so they can bring those important comments and questions into the conversation. Now let's move on to the conversation for today. Let me introduce our hosts and they will introduce the rest of our STEAM panel for this afternoon's discussion. Our hosts for today are Ray Habersky Jr., Professor of History and Director of American Studies at IUPUI. He also directs the Institute for American Thought and is a part of the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture. Dr. Habersky is trained in 20th century US history with a focus on intellectual history. And he is an editor along with Phil Goff and Reese Williams of the forthcoming book, I think it's already out, Civil Religion Today, Religion, and the American nation in the 21st century, or it will be out soon. Yeah. And our other host is Christina Horn Sheeler. She is a professor of communication studies and the executive associate dean of the Honors College at IUPUI. Her most recent book is the award-winning Woman President, Confronting mm. Post-Feminist Political Culture, co-authored with Karen Vasby Anderson, which assesses the debilitating frames through which the 2008 candidacies of Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin were presented to the public. And so without any further ado, I wanna hand it over to our host and get this critically important conversation started. All right, thank you, Joseph. It really is a pleasure for me to welcome the two other discussants for today's session. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, what I, I know is gonna be a really interesting uh, conversation and I'm sure the chat will be lively. So we have Elaine Pena of the Georgetown University and Nicole Phillips of Emory University. 
Elaine's areas of expertise include border studies, anthropology of religion, built environment, performance theory, transnationalism, Latinx and Latin American studies. Her most recent book, which has a dynamite cover, is called Viva George, celebrating uh, Washington's birthday at the US-Mexico border. Nicole's research interests include the intersection of religion and American public life with a focus on community and congregational studies where she investigates the moral commitments and vision of community and congregational members. Her scholarship treats religion, critical race theory, gender, and cultural memory studies. Her most recent book is titled Patriotism, Black and White, The Color of American Exceptionalism. So it is a pleasure to welcome everyone today. We thought we would start with uh, brief statements on yesterday's uh, inauguration, uh, the address, and perhaps uh, uh, the intersection between your own research and what you saw yesterday. So I think Elaine, would you start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ray. Thank you to everyone for being here. It's going to be a wonderful conversation. Um, so as Ray said, I'm an associate professor of American studies at George Washington University, and I focus on ritual, material religion, border and transnational studies. And yes, thinking about today, I'm um, thinking about yesterday, thinking about the events of January 6th, um, I thought about uh, Viva George and, and the book that I just published, which examines cross-border cooperation during times of crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. And Viva George examines um, the tradition of celebrating George Washington's birthday every single February at the Port of Laredo since 1898 a tradition that was started by the Improved Order of Red Men. And if you know anything about the Improved Order of Red Men, we can have an amazing discussion later. But this is all to say that I saw a lot of overlap between my research at the US-Mexico border and thinking about patriotism's proper geography and what happens during inauguration ceremonies, especially yesterday. And for better or for worse, I did see overlap with some of the events of January 6th, which is unsettling and yeah. which I'm happy to talk about. So this is all saying that there's a translocal repertoire of playing hmm. that is um, in operation here. Yeah. And so I was thinking a lot about yesterday just by itself, the, the significance of it. And I found myself thinking, about my first book, Performing Piety, and what I focus on there, which is the sacralization of space, the, sanctif the sanctification of space. So I want to focus my few remarks today on the sanctification of space that I saw going on yesterday. Um, first, I want to note that the inaugural stage at the US Capitol, the primary site of ritual, was big enough yesterday. Right? And, you know, it was big enough for uh, Vice President Harris and uh, Justice Sotomayor to have that very important ritual moment. It was big enough for J-Lo speaking Spanish. It was big enough for Lady Gaga's train. It was big enough for Garth Brooks' cowboy hat. Um, <laughs> but it was also, and more importantly, big enough for Amanda Gorman's yeah. path breaking, just truth speaking moment, right? Mm. And I was, I was watching the coverage yesterday and I was really taken aback when I heard an interview with Amanda Gorman on CNN after all was said and done. And she said specifically that when she was preparing her remarks, that she was thinking about re-sanctifying the U.S. Capitol, re-sanctifying the U.S. Capitol after the events of January 6th. And so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just in that moment where I'm thinking, how did the U.S. Capitol become big enough for Amanda Gorman in particular, right? Um, so I was thinking about it. And, you know, I think that the process of making that stage big enough happened the night before with the candlelight vigil and using the reflection pool and the Lincoln Memorial. 
I think that the space was made big enough with the placement of flags on the mall itself. I think that the space was made big enough um, with three former presidents speaking in front of the World War II Memorial, mm. right? And, and, you know, I think that a lot of the use of space in this instance is COVID related, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They were making it virtual for everyone to see. Um, but really, it was, it was the words, which I know we're going to talk a lot about today. It was the site and it was the timing, right? And the last example that I want to bring up was Vice President Harris addressing the nation as vice president, again, in front of the Lincoln Memorial and drawing our attention to another idea that I think plays into American civil religion, which is American aspiration. And I'm just really eager to unpack that, especially because I think it re it, it calibrates American civil religion to bring in the diversity that was on the various stages yesterday and that it was ready to be made big enough for everything that was happening and everything that has happened. And so I'm very excited to have this conversation. And this is, this is what I was thinking about the sanctification of space. Perfect. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you very, very much. All right, Nicole, can you take it yeah. away? Sure. So um, uh, one of my areas of interest that I did not declare, um, but it's obvious from my um, monograph on patriotism, black and white is race, religion, and the US nation. And so when I thought about yesterday in um, comparison to January 6th, um, I thought about it in terms of uh, the inauguration itself um, that uh, we know um, uh, as, as um, determined and given to us by uh, Kuhn and Chapel uh, was a right of intensification. And what exactly is a right of intensification? Um, rights, rights of intensification are rights of passage writ, writ large. They are ceremonies that reaffirm the authority, the identity, the ideologies, the moral values, the commitments, the structures of social groups and institutions. But the inauguration was exceptional. Um, it, uh, and, and we can think about this also in terms of um, uh, uh, American exceptionalism, but it was extraordinary in that as a rite of intensification, it reminded us as Americans of our group allegiances, of our loyalties, of, um, of all that contributes to group consensus. And we needed the inauguration. Um, uh, it is, um, I don't wanna say it, it was scheduled, right? January 20th, um, but it was fortuitous uh, that we had it uh, um, almost two weeks after January 6th because January 6th definitely represented uh, group uh, contestation uh, and to an extreme group division. And when I say group division, I'm talking about uh, with respect to Americans and re with respect to American national identity or uh, an American civil religion. And so the inauguration uh, and in light of also the civil religious speech and rhetoric of our president around unity and healing and reinforced by the black civil religious poem that mm -hmm. Amanda Gorman delivered, um, uh, reminded us that we, uh, uh, that we are we the people, that we are uh, all Americans. Uh, and and uh, I, uh, Elaine took note of the space being big enough. And I took note of, um, while she looks at space, I, I took note of the races and the ethnicities who were involved uh, in the programming. So we had a, a Garth Brooks, who is a country um, music star, and we had a Jennifer Lopez, who is a you know, pop cultural icon and Latina. And we had an Amanda Gorman, who is a, um, uh, 
22 year old uh, now it's turning into a phenom because of yeah. her uh, yeah. very much uh, uh, civil religious poem that um, that elaborated on the the presidential message that the presidential message that uh, our president delivered. And so yesterday was about group consensus and group loyalty. That is a reflection of what we understand as American civil religion, uh, which all um, nationalities, races, ethnicities participate in. Uh, it is a public faith. Mm. Um, it does not require, um, it does not require, um, um, one to be uh, native born. It engrafts those who are immigrants, um, those who might be looked at outside of um, the, the U.S. tent. Um, while, while January 6th was reflective of a Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And Christian nationalism, and, I, and I'm informed of the thinking of uh, Philip Gorski, as well as Sam Perry and Andrew Whitehead around Christian nationalism, because I'm just starting to study that. But the Christian nationalism is around this fusion of religion and politics. Um, it, it privileges Christian identity, but it privileges Christian identity to the exclusion of others. And it embraces a preservation of a particular social order. Um, and we saw that yeah. with the flags that were being flown, as well as the rhetoric on January 6th, this type of Christian nationalism that um, is ends up being, um, uh, ends up co-opting the, the, the symbolism, Christian symbolism, Christian iconography um, for social and political ends and ends up being very much exclusionary. And so the distinction between an American civil religion and a Christian nationalism was prominent to me yeah. on yesterday. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Christy, why don't you Give us some comments and reflections. Thanks, Ray. My, my comments really kind of align nicely with what Elaine and Nicole have already said. Joseph talked to you about my book, uh, Woman President. And in that book, I look at the, the candidacies of Hillary Clinton and, and Sarah Palin in 2008. And my co-author and I argue that their candidacies demonstrate the extent to which what we call a rhetoric of post-feminism constituted a significant backlash against female presidentiality. So I wanna, I wanna speak on that for just a moment as I, I then tra transition to a look at the specific rhetoric of the day. But I, I guess I wanna caution us because even with the swearing in of Vice President Kamala Harris, we still see evidence of this backlash today as the power of white masculinity really seeks to undermine her competence as a political leader and frame her as too ambitious, too monstrous, overruly, and overstepping her bounds. And of course, as both my, my colleagues have mentioned, the power of white masculinity has also done its best to subvert the democratic process and defame our sacred democratic spaces. And so my word of caution about Harris's inauguration, however, is that it doesn't mean that we have moved beyond a need for a focus on gender justice any more than it means that Obama's presidency or, or Harris's vice presidency signals a, that, that we've entered a post-racial culture. I mean, quite the contrary, of course. So I've studied presidential rhetoric and the norms that um, influence our political culture my entire career. And, and I can really think of no other time other than maybe the Civil War and World, World War II where presidential rhetoric was thought to matter more. Um, and I, I recall sharing uh, the other day when the panelists and I met, I, my anxiety uh, prior to yesterday due to the multiple exigencies um, that the day and its, its discourse uh, responded to. So I'm a rhetorical scholar. I'm familiar with the expectations of inaugural addresses and their importance in defining who we are as a people and a nation. And so in this role, as we've already mentioned, the, 
the president often speaks as a prophet and a priest, attempting to unify the audience around common values, setting forth uh, the principles that will guide the administration and demonstrating an appreciation for the executive office, really steeped in the tradition in the uh, in the office and the the founding documents, and as such, then the audience is really urged to contemplate on the significance and symbolism of the day and its place in our shared history and hoped for future. So, given the events of the last year, culminating with the invasion of the Capitol on January sixth, the bar was really high for President Biden. Hence, my anxieties. And so then what we saw yesterday as, as my colleagues have, have started to, to unpack is that we really saw metaphors of rebirth and renewal and healing much like Lincoln uh, in, the, in the Civil War era. Uh, Biden wove together his American story in which democracy prevailed. It wasn't a party or an individual, but it was democracy that prevailed. And he noted early on in the speech, he confronted the January 6th um, mm -hmm. uh, episode. He noted early on, uh, this hollowed ground where just a few days ago, violence sought to shake the Capitol's very foundation. We come together as one nation under God, indivisible to carry out the peaceful transfer of power. So Biden's words right there called us really to rededicate ourselves in pursuit of a more perfect union. We witnessed our new leaders swearing the same oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and all that our nation represents and can be. The rituals and symbols that filled our television and, and com computer screens really served as visual reminders of the sanctity of the Capitol. And, and, and much like Elaine said, you know, that, that space I, I feel like the, the day's events and Biden's words really work to re-sanctify, cleanse that space uh, for the work of our, of our democracy. Um, in a sense, the day was about restoring the soul of our nation and our democracy. Um, while the ultimate theme was unity and healing, though, I, Biden didn't um, steer away from calling out some of the really ugliness of our time, including systemic racism, white supremacy, climate change, a pandemic, economic uncertainty. I mean, he called out anger, hatred, violence, misinformation. And then by contrast, in a, in a passage referencing St. Augustine, he talked about the common values that unite us as a citizenry against those very evils. Things like opportunity, security, liberty, dignity, respect, honor, and yes, the truth, with a duty and responsibility to protect our nation and rise to the occasion of a new and better world. So while I believe in his in his address and in the in the entirety of the event, I, I, I believe it rose to the occasion <laughs> and eased my anxiety a bit. I really was most moved by Amanda Gorman. I have to say yeah. there her somehow her words just spoke to me and really captured the exigence of the day the unity and moving us forward. And I think I was most moved by this particular line in her poem, The Hill We Climb. She said, um, it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks to our job. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I look forward to the conversation. Uh, excellent. Thank you all so much. I mean, you could end it here and be very happy. <laughs> I really appreciate that. So I, I, I feel like we have these, uh, if we could see these sort of three big themes that you've already introduced, you know, the, the idea of, of space become, becoming something inside a sacred space uh, that Elaine has identified and the, the parade of people that Nicole has, has told us move through this space and, 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 and give it meaning. And Christy, the idea that there's, there's a rhetoric of restoration that these people mm -hmm. carry with them uh, from the past into the present and what Biden had introduced or invited people to do into the future. And all of this, I mean, it is optimistic. 
it feels optimistic. And yet we know, all of you know very well, we've talked about this before, is that civil religion is sort of fraught with this tension between optimism and being a farce in a certain sense, that we have to sort of believe it as far as fake it until you make it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So can, can I ask you this? Can you, can you tell, tell us a bit more about this tension within civil religion and the conflict that perhaps is around the idea of American exceptionalism that often gets associated with civil religion? Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Or, Nicole, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to, just just to kind of get it started, American civil religion flattens intra-group difference. And that's why it's unbelievable. <laughs> that's why it's hard to get, you know, that's why it's hard to, to back up. Um, but I think that what we saw yesterday doesn't solve that problem, <laughs> okay. right? But yep. it definitely uh, pivots how, how, it can help us pivot how we engage American civil religion um, beyond its yes. conceptual limitations. That's great, thank you, thank you. Nicole? So I'll add to that, inherent to American civil religion um, are two, um, we can say strands or components that make up American civil religion. Um, uh, or, or, or I should say American civil religion is reflective of our, the type of democracy that we practice, right? We are a civic republic, but we are also a liberal democracy. So what does that mean? So a civic, being a civic republic, we ensure or we preserve um, the, the participation of all segments and all, um, all segments of society, regardless of um, uh, 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 um, identity politics, regardless of, of uh, race, regardless of gender, regardless of nationality, regardless of religion. Uh, and uh, that is upheld in our voting process, right? Mm -hmm. But we're also for we're also a, a, a liberal democracy, and a liberal democracy means that we embrace a market economy. So how can we be both <laughs> a liberal democracy, and and both a liberal democracy and a civic republic come under representative democracy? How can we be both a liberal democracy that allows for this market comp? Uh, competition that will uh, resolve in haves and have nots and a civic republic at the same time, which, which uh, preserves the participation of everyone. Yeah. So both, both strands of democracy are, or both components are at loggerheads. And that is the mm -hmm. same thing with an American civil um, there is the prophetic strand of American civil religion that points out um, the, the violations, that points out where we have gone wrong, um, that, that uh, contests um, uh, and, 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 and says we, are, we have not lived up to what is found in our sacred documents, our constitutional um, documents. But then there is the, the more um, uh, 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 priestly type of civil religion that's celebratory and conciliatory and doesn't really point out where we have erred and gone wrong. So the concept is a concept that is uh, fraught with tension because our democracy is one that is fraught with tensions. And in relationship to this American civil religion, we have American exceptionalism, right? And so while American exceptionalism, while our American civil religion makes us exceptional, and that is a component we have to also look at American exceptional, exceptionalism in relationship to our civil religion as something separate and distinct. And, and I think that that, when I, uh, when I hear Elaine and when I hear Christy um, um, 
uh, President Biden uh, did an excellent job of pointing out um, uh, what makes us American. Um, but he also pointed out what makes us exceptional. And then as everyone's saying, Amanda Gorman does the same. What makes us American and what makes us exceptional? And when I was thinking about her poem, Langston Hughes' Let America Be America Again is both a poem about American national identity and American exceptionalism. And in the poem, he points to the unexceptionalisms of America while pointing to the exceptionalisms. And she does the same thing in her poetry. She points to what makes us exceptional. And, and, and I too listened to the CNN um, uh, interview that she had um, and, uh, and, um, and she said that she, when she was writing, uh, what's, you, she came to a point where, you know, she, she didn't um, know where to go next. And uh, January 6th helped her to finish her poem because she was, what she said is that I didn't want to gloss over the unexceptional. Yeah, right. That's right. I'm wondering to what extent does the notion of a more perfect union help help us resolve these, you know, the challenges, the 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 competing identities, the the competing perspectives that that you've identified. Um, I mean, I heard it in Biden. It's you know, of course, Barack Obama. Um, I mean, we can identify it previously, but it's the you know the notion that we we mess up. And then there, we move to fix it. I don't know that perfection is ever possible. Maybe it is. I don't know. But but it it, it feels to me like just the the acknowledgement of error. Um, and then you know just the the movement toward the good, whatever that good is, <laughs> the common good, the the better good, the greater good. Um, is is that a point where that begins to resolve those tensions? Could, could we could we sit with Amanda Gorman for a little bit? Because I think oh Christine, yeah yeah because I, mean, I think you've really uh, this is, you've you've landed on something. I mean she seemed to as uh, Biden certainly addressed January six, but did Amanda Gorman give us something that even the president in a sense could not yesterday? In a sense, what was she? better at holding up a mirror for all Americans or for the day? And if so, why? <laughs> what was it that made that made her moment so unique or so extraordinary or so maybe exceptional? He's not the president. <laughs> well, maybe there's something to that. I'm not, I'm not yeah. kidding. I'm yeah. not kidding. I mean. Well, yeah, I agree with Christy. She's not the president, but she's also a genius. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's just let's just get that out of the way but i think what, what amanda did yesterday was she pointed out that the first thing that should come to our mind when we think about what america is is that america is a work in progress right so we're not striving to be a more perfect union that that leads us in all the wrong places right a more perfect presuming that perfection is possible or that perfection had has existed at one point in time no Amanda Gorman set us on another path, another way of thinking where it's the work, it's, it's the investment, and it's the self-reflection that goes into the work in progress. And, and that's where we are. Mm -hmm. And we can't, we can't pretend, we can't gloss over um, anything at this point because January 6th happened. People are dying with COVID, the racial, <laughs> the racial in, in, inequities are palpable and deadly with COVID. Like we cannot um, kind of uh, fuss over the other things. Like we have to know where we are. And I think that's what she did. And also she's a genius and also she's not the president. <laughs> <laughs> not, and, and, and I agree with everything that has been said. She is not the president. And um, yes, and so the bar is high 
for President Biden given our last four years. But I also think what made um, her um, exceptional is, is that in her poem, she told her story. Mm -hmm. And so the president, meaning President Biden, in delivering his address gives us American civil religious language that causes this group cohesion and group consensus. And then she comes behind and she reinforces the shared language, the shared discourse of Americans, yet her story is different than our president's story. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I love, I, I, I so connect with President Biden um, as a, an interestingly, as a, a black woman to this white male, because for me, he represents um, no shame around telling his story. He doesn't, uh, I mean, in, in and of being a white male, he has white privilege, right? But, um, but a, a person who is marginalized can enter into a dialogue with him because, because we know his story. We know of the death of his first wife. We know the death of Bo. We know, and I loved the fact that they went to Ireland to show that he has roots. And we often don't hear hmm. the stories of white Americans, white privilege often, um, and, and white guilt, guilt too, yeah. um, often shrouds, shrouds white American stories. And we, I connect with him and, and he in and of himself was part of the display yesterday in that space because we know his story but juxtaposed to his story we have this young woman who said in her and i'm not going to quote it exactly but i was struck when she said i come from a single mother or single mm -hmm. parent household mm -hmm. and i dream of being president but i am now delivering this message in front of a president. And so it goes back to right. this kind of covenant that makes us all Americans and the room for different and diverse and distinct stories. And I think for me, that is why, that is how she was distinct from, but in connection to President Biden. Yeah, Sherry Rabin writes in a, in a question, she wonders if Amanda Gorman, the impact also has to do with the power of poetry and creative arts and shaping national mythology in thinking about genre, maybe poetry is able to be more effectively sermonic uh, than political speech in this moment. That, that, that's perhaps you know, where the power of, of Amanda Gorman's moment uh, uh, lies. Um, and Reese Williams uh, points out that at uh, Langston Hughes and that famous poem also said that America has never been America to me. Right. And, and that, and again, perhaps it is this, uh, it's the ability of poetry, perhaps the humanistic arts in some ways to show the limits that, of, of politics in a way that a president can't. Agreed. Well, for what it's worth, Biden often quotes poetry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what I, I'm not what sure where I'm going that, huh? with. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where to go with it. And it's I, you, I, Irish poetry or Irish literature. Yeah. Um, uh, so maybe that does speak to the, you know, the power of literature, the humanities, humanistic forms that that he doesn't have access to otherwise or can't communicate otherwise. Maybe we could we could return a little bit to the limits of, of civil religion. And I think the themes that you've all uh, touched upon, that civil religion also implies plenty of people who are not often included or uh, are people who are ex actively excluded. And that inaugural addresses try to create the, the, the answer to who are we? But 
where do you come down after yesterday? Who are we after yesterday's address and after, day, after yesterday's events and festivities? How would you answer that? Well, we're a people of values. Um, I mean, Biden articulated our values. Um, we're a people committed to democracy, the value of democracy and moving this country forward. Um, you know, Biden made space for not only those who agree with him, but those who don't agree with him um, while, while calling out the, the protesters or the, you know, the, those who, per, who perpetuate untruths and those who, um, um, you know, deal in anger and deal in misinformation and, and hatred. So, so I do think there was a division there. I, you know, unity is a tricky term mm -hmm. in terms of who we are and, and unifying behind that who we are. Um, a, a communication scholar whom I've read a great deal, Kenneth Burke, articulates, uh, argues that there's no unification without division. Mm -hmm. So there's never perfect unification. There's always some, some element of division, separation, distinction, exceptionalism. Yeah. I don't know. I, I would say who we are is, uh, and this is about to be controversial, um, but that's okay. <laughs> um, who we are is um, we still are a city on a hill. <laughs> um, <laughs> Come on, Nicole. Come on. <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, who we are, if we are thinking about it in its traditional construction, uh, in terms of a city on a hill, when John Winthrop articulated it, he was, he was putting the onus on um, being responsible for the common good. Mm. Um, and I, 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 I don't want us to um, have the, to, to miss, um, even though the four years have been challenging because of yeah. the rhetoric and mm -hmm. the behavior of our last president, our former president. <laughs> um, um, in my book, I, 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 I talk about um, the despotic aspects of democracy as well as the democratic aspects. So up against despotism, you're always gonna have democracy. You're always gonna have dreaming. You're always gonna have people who are working and striving towards a, a common good. And so, um, and so I don't want us to kind of throw out the baby with the bath water. Um, although the city on a hill uh, concept is loaded yeah, and yeah. must be critiqued. Yeah. And, um, and I'll just say this one thing and leave it there. And I think uh, that uh, Kamala Harris's uh, um, being inaugurated represents an aspect of the city on a hill. Mm -hmm. And I'll hold that. Okay. Um, uh, but, but also who we are is at this point, we also are a nation of nationalists and pluralists. And what do we do with that? All right. Thanks. Elaine. I was wondering if I could complicate yes. this even yes. more, mm -hmm. yep. which is okay. We know from yesterday, um, from Biden's speech and other remarks that were given throughout the day, the evening before and into the night of Inauguration Day, yeah. that we still want to hold on to the city on a hill idea. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, it's there. No one has said, you know, it's time to do away with that. Like, we lost our standing, so let's just give up the dream, right? That the, they were holding on, holding on. And I wonder, though, if mm, the remarks yesterday and, and nodding to City on a Hill could have been possible and maybe even s more effective than they have been or that, or that they are, if January 6th hadn't, it ha hadn't had happened. Like, 
do we need January 6th to talk about yesterday in the way that we're talking about it? That's a great question. Christy, you study how we talk. <laughs> I do. How, how, important, how important is that flashpoint uh, to the conversations we're having about our identity, about our future, about what it means to be American? Um, how much did January 6th, 6th uh, concentrate, I don't know, uh, the language we use? The la okay. There, I I was take I was going in another direction. No, language ahead, we but well language we, we use versus language that we've heard for four years. Okay. I think I think January sixth was a flashpoint, as you said, and it gave us something to focus on. Mm -hmm. I think it was emblematic of the last four years and the discourse that we heard okay. from um from our former president um and from those who I guess feel as if they have a right to live on top of the city on a hill, even though they aren't really living on a city, you know, in a city mm -hmm. on a hill. Um, but the but the language that we heard for for the last four years, it was violent. I some of my communication colleagues um, talked about the weapon is weaponizing of presidential rhetoric right to the to the extent to which you know um you know uh locker up hanger um you know we can go back to the the 2016 elections oh, yeah. right so i don't think i don't i don't think that the i i think maybe it gave us you know that thing to focus on and then move away from that made it perhaps easier or more efficient to um, to call out political language, but that political language has ha been happening for quite some time. It, it was just that this president has emboldened yeah. that language. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And in my mind, you know, January 6th, because of the events and where they happened, yeah. made yesterday possible. Right. So and, and us kind of tracing yeah. the repetition of city on a hill tropes and ideas of American exceptionalism. I think that event, the side of that event empowered people yesterday to use the language, but for it not to fall short as it usually does. Okay. And this was all kind of building for four years and that I was thinking a lot about one without the other and that that's where I was my mind was taking me yeah I and think that's such yeah that's such an important observation an important argument Elaine that it's the space it's the rhetoric of the space and the political as part of the political rhetoric that yes. that really created that that flashpoint the space is so important. Yeah. You're right. So one of the things that was perhaps most surprising to me is that we we have we have heard anti-Washington, anti-government rhetoric for so long, and certainly the <laughs> in some ways maybe it was the end of the Reagan moment, you know, with with Trump. But um, the site that we were that was, was being defended in in a way, January sixth and yesterday was the Capitol. <laughs> you know. <laughs> In some ways, the yeah, you know, the, the the physical embodiment of the city, Nicole. <laughs> we were, I mean, Biden was trying to like lift it up, you know, onto his shoulders. Um, how how important is it, you know, in a sense, did people? Again, we we were talking about the memorialization of the state. The state is represented by those buildings. Uh, did the sacrifice on January sixth, the violence of January sixth, uh, the, the the um, the ceremonies that were uh, uh, were created for the COVID uh, deaths did that help us embrace something that has been denigrated for a very long time? Yes, <laughs> I would say yes. That's a that's a hard yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, sacrificial death, as we yeah. know. Yep. is 
one of the components um, or, or constituencies of an American civil religion or how we understand ourselves as Americans. Um, uh, the willingness to, if you are a soldier, the willingness to put oneself on the border, mm -hmm. on the line um, for the common good, which reminds the living of sacrificing for the common good. Mm -hmm. uh, um, however, and, and, and I don't remember if it was Elaine or Christy who said it earlier, um, but, but, but the assassination of uh, President Lincoln um, was the uh, kind of touchstone mm -hmm. for having um, sacrificial death or martyrdom be part of how we understand ourselves as a nation because of the context out of which or, uh, or out of which he was leading the, the country or the nation, um, which was divisive. Um, however, I don't want us to confuse all deaths are not sacrificial deaths. Um, and, um, and so the COVID-19 deaths are, I think, can in some respects be considered sacrificial deaths, but, mm. um, but their bodies have been sacrificed because of this uh, pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think when we are when uh, we're talking about sacrificial deaths, I think that there has to be some will in yeah. the sacrifice, yeah. okay. will on the part of those who are making the sacrifice. And so all deaths yeah. are not martyrdom. They're right. not everybody who's right. dying are not martyrs. Right. So that's what I would say in terms of um, January 6th. And I, I wouldn't consider those who died. Yeah. Um, yeah. Except maybe the police officers. Or yeah. What? yeah. Is I, it good? Want, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Elaine, go um, ahead. Really quickly, I want to note how throughout the day, um, invoking Lincoln's name, invoking Lincoln's work, mm -hmm. his sacrifice, um, one of the moments that stood out to me was I think it was Biden who said, or no, maybe it was Vice President Harris, but saying, you know, the scaffolding was still on the Capitol when Lincoln said, you know, let's move forward. Like it wasn't, this Capitol wasn't even finished yet. Yeah. So it's yeah. like the vision yeah. with the person who is the martyr yeah. that was being invoked yeah. and maybe added that other element. I mean, it was very strategic, very, very strategic. Yeah. How many times Washington was invoked, yeah. Lincoln was invoked. Washington, Lincoln, Washington, Lincoln. Bella would have been happy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it is quite true. So there's an interesting question about how civil religion relates to um, making a people sacred rather than a particular person. And, we, and you're right. I mean, we elevate the sort of um, the saints of American civil religion, Washington, Lincoln, uh, Bella, Kennedy, to some extent, right? Um, but how does civil religion deal with the people? as a sacred body? Well, I think that, I mean, civil, we are, we are using political figures because uh, civil religion is a public faith or the, the faith of a political or public square. Mm -hmm. So um, how we understand ourselves as in terms of our greatness and how we understand ourselves in terms of being American, um, because this concept comes out of the public square and because it comes out of the right. political yeah. arena, that's why we are lifting up political yeah. leaders. But the concept yeah. is meant to sacralize the nation. Yeah. And so it undergirds what uh, we the people um, stand for and brings up with respect to uh, sacrifice, um, the importance of bloodlines <laughs> and religion to understanding who we are as a people. And in that respect, that's where, um, and I won't go into it, but that's where um, I, there, I see a distinction between um, a black civil religious yeah. practice versus a white civil religious uh, 
practice Excellent. or civil religion. Yeah. There's, there's another question here about the rather interesting ceremony that, that accompanied the signing of executive orders yesterday and, and what that reflects in um, the day's events and, and the significance of the day as a sort of uh, a, a, a sacred ceremony. So we had uh, the, the, you know, the repealing of the, of the Muslim ban, the DACA ruling, rejoining of the Paris Climate Agreement. How, how does that fit in there? Yeah. Stopping border wall construction. Yes. You know, I mean, it was strategically televised to evidence the remarks during the inaugural ceremony mm -hmm. and all the other ideas that were being put out throughout the day. You know, there it was we're getting to work, but with these things, we're undoing what has happened in the past four years, but it, it evidenced the inclusiveness, the diversity, yeah. uh, even the COVID-19 um, executive act, right? I mean, it just put action behind the words. Yeah. yeah. And what allowed that to move so quickly is that there were no, um, you know, no inaugural balls, right? I mean, they would have been changing for the inaugural balls at that time. There would have would not have been action like that on day one. It may have happened today, yes, but it was it was unusual in terms of the the timing of those events. So so COVID allowed us to um, punctuate yeah. the importance of um, those actions. Yeah, the ceremony of the office met the work of the office mm -hmm. at the same time, which yeah. Yeah, was, mm -hmm. was a unique situation. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah. Yesterday was very um, ritualistic, as you, you said it. You said ceremonial um, um, in so many different ways, which um, goes back to um, the, these rites of intensification mm -hmm. and, and a new leadership um, uh, uh, redefining what it means to be American. Yeah. It would be interesting to see what kind of continuity comes out of the inaugural and goes into the State of the Union. Yeah. yeah. Especially given the, 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 again, the flurry of orders, executive orders and potential yeah. actions. And of course, we still haven't uh, resolved, uh, you know, the, the, the trial in the Senate, potentially, of the former president at this point, mm -hmm. uh, which would have it as a, a strange uh, sort of punctuation mark at the end of the, <laughs> of this uh, civil religious, right. yeah, yeah, civil right. religious period in our history. Right. All right. Any any uh, closing thoughts? What should we be looking for over the next with with the sort of moral authority that came out of the inaugural? Are there one or two things that you think we should be looking for from the new administration? Well, is that moral authority going to carry to the Senate? Okay. Uh, fifty fifty split. Um, is is the president going to have um, you know that honeymoon where yeah. there are some Republicans who are willing to work um, with you know across the aisle? Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think that <clears throat> remains to be seen. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I would say um, if we're thinking about moral authority, um, we do have to take Christian nationalism seriously. Seriously. Um, um, not just not just because of the exclusionary and discriminatory aspects of Christian nationalism, but but it also represents an, another way to understand moral authority. And so, um, how do we understand that moral tradition, or how that moral tradition is practiced up against other? Um, moral traditions, and as well as it represents um, in, in the same way that nuns um, yeah. represent the direction in which American religion is going, that is another component to a, a, a component for looking at um, how um, American religion is unfolding during this period in which we're living, which is more pluralistic and less kind of Christocentric. Yeah. Thank you very much. This was an excellent discussion. Uh, it, it is recorded, so I will be using it in class. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you all, and thank and thank everybody that uh, that was a part of the, uh, the Facebook Live. Uh, we look forward to future sessions like this. Thank you again to my my colleagues, and uh, we'll see you in social media. Oh, and please, uh, before we go, fill out the survey that is in the chat, if at all possible. Please take just a couple of minutes and fill out the survey. Thanks very much.